Greetings to everyone. Welcome back to my educational channel on biology. I'm teacher Janet and in this video we're going to discuss subtopic 2.2 of the Form 5 Biology KSSM syllabus and the title is the leaf as the main organ for Hirsch's exchange. So we're going to study the mechanism of the opening and closing of the stoma which is regulated by the gut cells. All right. So in sunlight, gut cells become turgid and the stoma opens. Whereas in darkness, gut cells are flaccid and the stoma closes. Let's find out more about this, how it happens. So here are the learning standards. Firstly, after this lesson, we should be able to explain or justify the necessity of gaseous exchange in plants. Why do plants need to carry out gaseous exchange? Secondly, we should be able to explain the mechanism of stomatal opening and closing based on the uptake of potassium ions into the gut cells and changes in the sucrose concentration in the gut cells. Thirdly, we should be able to conduct and explain an experiment to compare stomatal distribution on the upper and lower epidermis of monocotyledon and eucotyledon leaves. So this experiment will be discussed in another video. Fourthly, we should be able to predict with explanations the effect of water deficiency or a lack of water in plants on stomatal opening and closing on the opening and closing of the stoma so in this video we are going to study the leaf as the main organ for gaseous exchange the first learning outcome is justify or explain the necessity of gaseous exchange in plants right so plants synthesize their own food through photosynthesis, unlike animals that do not uh, produce their own food, but search for food from the environment. So in order to carry out photosynthesis efficiently, plants need to exchange gases and absorb light. Now, if you look at the equation for photosynthesis, the short form is wet go, water plus energy, yeah, which is light energy, plus carbon dioxide, okay, and then with the help of chlorophyll to absorb the light energy produces glucose and oxygen, right? So for photosynthesis to occur efficiently, plants need to exchange gases. They need to take in the carbon dioxide and release oxygen into the atmosphere, right? So gaseous exchange is actually the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between plants and the environment. And it occurs by diffusion of gases through the stomata, which are the pores in the, or openings in the leaves. Right, small openings in the leaves. Singular form is stoma, plural form is stomata. So gaseous exchange occurs by diffusion of gases through stomata during photosynthesis and respiration in plants. Now, stomata are actually tiny pores or openings for the gaseous exchange to occur, and they are located mainly on the lower epidermis or the lower surface of the leaf for eudicots, for plants called the types of plants called it, the type of plant called the eudicot. Now, gaseous exchange has to occur for, for what reason? So now we are going to justify the necessity of gaseous exchange. So gaseous exchange is necessary and has to occur so that carbon dioxide can diffuse from the environment or atmosphere through the stomata into leaf cells for photosynthesis during daytime, right? And excess oxygen produced from Photosynthesis can diffuse out of the leaf cells through the stomata. This also occurs in the daytime when photosynthesis is occurring. Now, at night, when there's no photosynthesis, oxygen needs to diffuse into the leaf from the environment, from the atmosphere, for respiration. Because in respiration, oxygen is needed. So this occurs at night. So number six huh, explains the necessity for gaseous exchange to occur in plants, right? It answers this question. Now next, each stoma is guarded by a pair of gut cells that controls the opening and closing of the stoma by becoming turgid or flaccid. Turgid means full of water. Flaccid means when it, the gut cells lack water in this case, right? And uh, when the gut cells are turgid or flaccid, the stoma will open Okay, or close accordingly. Okay, gut cells turgid, stomach opens. 
gut cells flaccid, stoma closes, right? So uh, the shape of the gut cells will change to open or close the stoma, right? So let's find out how gut cells open and close the stoma. Let's look at this question. Explain two adaptations of gut cells for their function. All right, so these are gut cells shown here. Now, gut cells contain chloroplasts, okay, the green structures here, to carry out photosynthesis so that they can produce sucrose, and sucrose will increase the osmotic pressure in the gut cells and increase the turgidity of the gut cells when water diffuses into the gut cells by osmosis. Okay, now compare the gut cells with the surrounding epidermal cells. Do surrounding epidermal cells have chloroplasts? No, they don't. Only the gut cells. Okay, they are specialized epidermal cells that contain chloroplasts. Secondly, a gut cell is bean shaped. Shaped like a bean or like a kidney. And it has a thinner, more elastic outer cell wall here. And a thicker, less elastic inner cell wall. So that when they become turgid, when the, each gut cell becomes turgid, the vacuum will press on the cell wall, right? And this will cause turgid pressure to occur. Then the thinner, more elastic outer wall will stretch more and will bend more than the inner wall, which is thicker. Thus, there will be a resultant force. All right, uh, outwards this way, and also for the other gut cell, it will go out this way. As the thinner, more elastic outer cell wall will curve more than the thicker, less elastic inner cell wall. Huh? It will not. This cell wall will not uh, curve inwards. Okay, but the thinner, more elastic cell wall will curve outwards. More. So this will open the stoma when the gut cells are turgid. So altogether, we see there are three uh, adaptations here. Gut cells contain chloroplasts. They are bean-shaped and they have a thinner, more elastic outer cell wall compared to the inner cell wall, which is thicker but less elastic. So now let's discuss the mechanism of stomatal opening and closing. Now, the mechanism of stomatal opening and closing actually depends on the condition of the gut cells, whether they are turgid, that means full of water and firm, or flaccid, that means when they lack water. So the condition of the gut cells, in turn, whether they are turgid or flaccid, depends on the potassium ion K+, plus, huh, uptake by the gut cells, and the sucrose concentration in the cell sap of the gut cells. All right? So let's find out how these two factors affect the condition of the gut cells and lead to the opening or closing of the stoma. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the mechanism of stomatal opening and closing. So it is it has been found that if sunlight shines on a pair of gut cells, the gut cells will move outwards and open the stoma. Whereas in darkness, the gut cells will move come together and close the stoma. So what is the reason for this? So this is caused by a series of events that take place in the gut cells when there is uh, more light, okay, or when there is less light. So let's have a look at the mechanism of stomatal opening, first of all. How does a stoma open in the presence of light? So in the presence of light, Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplasts in the gut cells. So glucose is produced and then glucose is converted into sucrose. So the concentration of sucrose, denoted by the red, red uh, triangles, in the gut cells increases. Right? Apart from that, a second event occurs and that is potassium ions, denoted by the blue squares enter the gut cells by active transport. 
So these two events cause the solute potential in the gut cells to increase. Solute potential is the concentration of dissolved substances such as sucrose and potassium ions. So the solute potential in the gut cells increases, or we say the osmotic pressure in the gut cells increases as more sucrose and potassium ions accumulate in the gut cells. But when the solute potential or solute concentration increases, water potential will uh, decrease instead. It's the reverse, okay, compared to solute potential. This means that the gut cells have high concentration of dissolved substances, but low concentration of uh, free water molecules. All right, so the epidermal cells surrounding the gut cells have higher water potential than the gut cells. So water will diffuse into the epi from the epidermal cells into the gut cells. Water diffuses from epidermal cells into the gut cells by osmosis. Okay, so gut cells receive water and they become turgid, full of water and turgid. Then the gut cells curve outwards because this outer cell wall here is more is thinner and more elastic than the inner cell wall here. Okay, than the inner cell wall here. Uh, this one. So since the outer wall curves outwards. All right, the whole uh, the gut cell will also curve outwards, and when both gut cells curve outwards, they will open the stoma. So, in summary, in the presence of light photosynthesis occurs in the gut cells, sucrose is produced, and then apart from that, potassium ions enter the gut cells by active transport. So, all these increase the solute potential in the gut cells as more sucrose and, and potassium ions accumulate in it, in the gut cell, but the water potential decreases, so water diffuses into the gut cells by osmosis. Okay, take note that when potassium ions move into the gut cells, water will also move in after that. Okay, now if potassium ions move out of the gut cells, water will move out, as we will see afterwards, when the stoma, uh, when it's re uh, related to the stomatal closure, right? Uh, but in this case, Potassium ions move into the gut cells, so the water also diffuses into the gut cells by osmosis. Okay, then gut cells become turgid, curve upwards, and the stoma opens. Now, how does the stoma close when in darkness? Okay, so in the absence of light, photosynthesis does not occur in the gut cells, and sucrose is not produced. Furthermore, uh, sugars like sucrose is converted to starch. So this is the reverse of the situation when uh, in the light, when the stoma is in the presence of light. Okay. So now the concentration of sucrose in the gut cells decreases because sucrose is not being produced through photosynthesis when there's the absence of light or when it is the gut cells are in darkness, right? And then potassium ions move out of the gut cells. Again, this is the reverse huh, of the situation when there's light. So overall, the solute potential in the gut cells decreases as there are less sucrose molecules and potassium ions in the gut cells. Now, water. Water potential in the gut cells increases instead when the solute potential decreases. Okay, That means there's a high concentration of water in the gut cells. We can say that the solution or the cytoplasmic fluid and the uh, uh, fluid in the vacuole has higher water potential or higher water concentration than the other epidermal cells, than the epidermal cells outside the gut cells. So water molecules will diffuse out from the gut cells with high water potential into the epidermal cells by osmosis. Then the gut cells will lose water, right? So they, they become flaccid, they lack water. And then the turgor pressure decreases and then uh, the outer cell wall will not curve so much. Okay, will not curve out so much. So when the gut cells are flaccid, the stoma will close.
So in this real life photograph, we can see the a pair of dark cells in a slanted position, right? And the center here is the stomato core of the stomach, right? The dark part. Here. So for each part cell, you can see there are a lot of organelles called the chloroplasts, which are greenish in color, that help to carry out photosynthesis and produce the sucrose in the presence of sunlight, right? Uh, here you can see something that looks like a Alright, so um, we can see the movement of the gut cells here. For example, when you see this uh, gut cell moving upwards, uh, it's between the stoma, and then it comes inwards, it's closing the stoma. You get this cell wall here, right? So open, close. Open, close. Open, close. So this is how the gut cells open and then close the stoma. And apart from that, you can see that each gut cell is being shaped. So what is the importance of stomatal opening in plants? Why does the stoma need to open? Firstly, it is to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse into the leaf for the process of photosynthesis. Secondly, the open stoma allows water to evaporate and diffuse out of the leaf during transpiration. So this will cool the plant as the water evaporates from the leaf cells and it also cools, creates a force called the transpirational pool to draw water up from the roots to the leaves for photosynthesis. So the leaves need water for photosynthesis and they get the supply of water from the roots using a force called transpirational pool, which is a sucking or suction force that pulls the water from the roots to the leaves. We'll study more about transpirational pool in another chapter. Next, we have oxygen. So oxygen is produced during photosynthesis, and if it's in excess, if it's not used for respiration, then it will diffuse out of the leaf during photosynthesis. Next, we go on to the effect of water deficiency or lack of water in plants on the stomatal opening and closing, on the opening and closing of the stoma. What is the effect of lack of water in plants on the opening and closing of the stoma or stomata? So, when the stomata in leaves open widely, like in this case, the rate of water loss through evaporation is very high. Water will diffuse out very quickly from the leaves and then it will cause the rate of water loss from the cells to be high. So how does the plant prevent further water loss? It has to close the stomata. If let's say it is facing a lack of water due to the high rate of evaporation and transpiration, then it has to close the stomata to prevent further loss of water, right? So the opening and closing of the stoma or stomata depends on the turgor pressure of gut cells. Now, turgor pressure means the force or pressure that is exerted by the fluid or water, especially in the vacuum, against the cell wall of a cell. So, turgor pressure is higher when the cell is turgid, right? And the vacuum expands uh, a lot and then it will press on the cell wall to create that turgor pressure. So, as we have studied just now in the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata, when the turgor pressure, if the turgor pressure of these two gut cells is high, it will cause the gut cells to be turgid, full of water, and then the stoma will open. Okay? So when the gut cells are turgid, we know that the outer cell wall, which is thinner and more elastic, it will curve out more this way, okay, in this direction, outwards and in this direction also outwards. And this will cause the stoma to open. We have already studied that just now. So likewise, or in reverse, huh, or the reverse situation, if the turgor pressure of the gut cells is low, this occurs when uh, there's a lack of water in the gut cells, less water in the gut cells, then the gut cells will be flaccid. They, will, they have a lack of water and they will be flaccid, okay, meaning that the turgor pressure is low and then the stoma will close. Alright, you move inwards. The inner wall will move inwards.
and then the stoma will close. Now this has been studied just now. Now in the previous slides we have seen that when there is high light intensity, the stomata will open. All right. How about the effect of water deficiency in plants on stomatal opening and closing? So when a plant obtains enough water, gut cells become turgid and then they are full of water and the turgor pressure in the cell will increase. So the vacuoles will press on the cell walls of the gut cells, right? And then the inner cell wall of the gut cells is thicker and less elastic compared to the outer cell wall here, right? That means the thinner, more elastic outer cell wall can curve out more, all right? It's more elastic. So it curve outwards due to turgor pressure. And thus, it will cause the gut cells, whole gut cell to curve outwards. All right, so this will open the stoma. So in turgid condition, when the gut cells are in turgid condition, the stoma opens. But what happens when the gut cells are in flaccid condition? So when a plant lacks water, does not have enough water in the soil, for it to absorb into its cells, right? Then the scut cells will become flaccid. That means they have lack of water in the cells and they lose their turgidity and the turgor pressure in the gut cells decre decreases. Now this will cause the stoma to close. Okay, so in flaccid condition, we know that uh, when the gut cells are in flaccid condition, the stoma closes. This we have studied earlier. All right, now advantage. So what's the advantage? of this situation. When a plant lacks water, gut cells close the stoma. There is an advantage. Because in hot and dry conditions, when the water loss due to evaporation is high, the gut cells will become flaccid, right? Then they close the stomata. So this will benefit the plant because when the stomata close, it will prevent more uh, water loss by evaporation. So it will prevent the dehydration of the plant. All right, when the whole plant is already wilted like this. Okay, so you can, if you see a wilted plant, you can be sure that uh, it's most probably the stomata have closed, right? Because the gut cells will be flaccid in such a condition. And then this will help to reduce further loss of water by transpiration and prevent the dehydration and death of the plant. Now we come to the questions, right? So there are quite a number of questions on stomata in the exam. Now, state three differences between the gut cells at stage X and Y. Let's say you're given two sets of diagrams. Huh? The first one, the pair of gut cells look like this. And this is stage X. And the second one, the pair of gut cells look like this. This is stage Y. So let's say you're given a table. Huh? The table is already given. So in the structured question, so you just fill up the table. Now, if no table is given and only lines are given, horizontal lines are given, for you to write the answer in paragraph, then you don't draw a table, right? So if no table is drawn in the structured question, huh, the short questions, then please don't draw the table. Now, in this case, let's say there's a table here. So the gut cells in stage X are turgid. That's why they curve outwards, right? Whereas the gut cells in stage Y are flaccid. They lack water and they have moved inwards. So the gut cells curve outwards so that the stoma is opened in the day. This is the difference. It causes the stoma to open. But in Y, the gut cells do not curve outwards. So the stoma is closed at night. This usually occurs at night. Now another difference is in the concentration of sucrose and the uh, concentration of potassium ions. So for stage X, sucrose is produced through uh, photosynthesis, all right, during photosynthesis, and also there is active transport of potassium ions into the cell, gut cells. So the solute potential or the osmotic pressure in the gut cells increases in this stage. But for stage Y, the sucrose is not produced in fact, the sucrose may be converted back to starch for storage. 
and then the solute potential or osmotic pressure in the gut cells decreases or is lower okay, compared to stage X. Furthermore, potassium ions will move out of the gut cells. Okay, so all this will decrease the solute potential or osmotic pressure in the gut cells. Okay, so stage X has higher solute potential. Stage Y has lower solute potential. Now let's go on to the second question. How is the stomata in cacti adapted to reduce water loss? Okay, so one of the methods to reduce water loss, especially for cacti that live in the desert that is hot and dry, one of the ways that they reduce water loss through the stomata is that they open their stomata only during the night for carbon dioxide to diffuse into the plant first. And then this carbon dioxide will be used in photosynthesis uh, later on in the daytime. So lower temperatures at night can reduce the loss of water from the leaves by evaporation. That's why the stomata are open at night. When there's lower temperatures, when there are lower temperatures and the rate of water loss from leaves is reduced. Okay, but it helps the carbon dioxide to diffuse into the plant for photosynthesis later on. Now, this one question from the textbook, Hot's question, which uh, you you will have to answer, right? So let's look at the, the answer uh, given. What is the difference between the leaf cuticle of a desert plant and an aquatic plant? Explain why. So it's not about stomata here. Uh, it's about the leaf cuticle, the waxy cuticle on top of the leaf. Now, the difference between desert plant and aquatic plant is because of the environmental conditions. Okay, now for the desert plant, the leaf cuticle of a desert plant, which is sometimes called a xerophyte, xerophyte is a plant that lives in hot and dry habitats. You'll find out more in chapter 7. Right, so the leaf cuticle of a desert plant is much thicker or thinner. Uh, that's what's the answer? It's thicker, right? than that of an aquatic plant. Now the reason, the conditions in the desert are very what? Hot and dry. So a desert plant has a very thick cuticle to what water loss? Increase or decrease? It's to reduce huh? or decrease water loss by what process? Transpiration, right? So the thick cuticle will reduce the water loss on a hot uh, on on a hot day and it will help the plant to conserve the water okay for their needs now how about aquatic plant aquatic plant is called a hydrophyte which is a plant that lives in aquatic habitats either on the water surface or submerged in water right so it lives in an aquatic environment right which does not face a lack of what water huh? and does its leaves have thick or thin cuticles thin cuticles okay like this water lily here right now cuticles on top of the surface but it's much thinner cuticles thinner than that of the desert plant as it does not need to what water loss to reduce water loss okay it has abundance of water all around it and it can absorb the water through which organ? Through its roots. Okay, so it can obtain enough water from ponds and lakes by using its roots, or by diffusion of water through the epidermis, especially for submerged plants. All right, they just allow the water to diffuse into the plant body through the epidermis. Let's look at this interesting and important question. Explain the difference in the distribution of stomata between leaves of eudicotyledons and those of monocotyledons. So let's look at the eudicotyledons first. For eudicotyledons, the lower surface of the leaf has a greater number of stomata compared to the upper surface. Okay, But for monocotyledons, both the upper and lower surfaces have usually, usually have an equal number of stomata. All right. So what is the reason that eudicotyledons have a greater number of stomata on the lower surface compared to the upper surface? Right? more stomata on the lower surface in this cross-section of the leaf 
and less tomata on the upper surface. Now, the reason for this is because the leaves of the eudicotyledons are held in a horizontal position. So the position of the leaf makes the difference, uh, uh, causes the difference in the eudicots and monocots. Now, the position of the leaf in eudic eudicots are horizontal, like in this mango plant here. Uh, you see, the, the leaves are held horizontally. Thus, the lower surface of the leaf is less exposed to direct sunlight compared to the upper surface, because the upper surface is exposed to the sunlight from above, right? But the lower surface is in a shaded place, is underneath. So to prevent excessive loss of water by evaporation, right? There are more stomata on the lower surface, leaf surface, to help prevent excessive loss of water through the stomata, okay? If you have more stomata on the upper surface compared to the lower surface, then a lot of water will be lost as the sunlight uh, shines on the leaf uh, because it will heat up the leaf and the water will evaporate through the open stomata, right? But, but at the lower, on the lower surface, the temperature is uh, not so high as the up, on the upper surface and it is not exposed directly to sunlight, okay? So by having more stomata on the lower surface, it helps to prevent excessive water loss by transpiration through the stomata. Now let's look at the monocotyledons. So in monocotyledons, it's different. Huh? Usually it's different, okay? Although later when we discuss the experiment from the textbook, huh? experiment 2.1, you will see that the textbook in the table of results is different, okay? I will tell, explain this in the experiment, the experiment that I'm going to discuss about stomata huh? later on. So in monocotyledons, both the upper and lower surfaces usually have equal number of stomata. Both the upper and lower leaf surfaces usually have equal number of stomata. Now, what's the reason? The reason is because the leaves of monocots are held vertically, like this, in this vertical position, upright position, compared to the uricot leaf that's held in a horizontal position. So, examples are the pineapple plant, which is a monocot, and the maize plant. Okay, you can see the leaf of the pineapple plant is almost vertical. And same for the maize plant. So, both surfaces of the leaf get equal amounts of sunlight, the upper surface and the lower surface, okay? Almost equal amount of sunlight, and they have the same rate of transpiration. So there's no need to have more stomata on the upper or lower surface. Thus, there's an equal distribution of stomata on both surfaces, okay? All right, this question is, compare the stomata of eudicot plants to stomata of monocot plants. And just now in question four, we've seen that one of the differences between the stomata of eudicot and monocot plants is the distribution of stomata, which we'll discuss here in the second difference. Now look at the first difference. The shape of the gut cells of eudicot plants and monocot plants are also different. Okay, first of all, we must be aware eudicot plants, they are those plants that have uh, leaves with a network of veins, as seen here. The veins form like a net uh, over the, uh, on the leaf. The pattern is like a net. Now, for monocot plants, the leaves are parallel, have parallel veins, as seen here. Okay, the veins are parallel to each other. All right, now we are going to look at the aspect of the stomata. So, look at the shape of the gut cells here. The shape of gut cells in the eudicot plant is bean shape, shaped like a bean, all right? Or like a kidney. Now, for the monocot plants, the gut cells are dumbbell shaped. So a dumbbell is, a, is an object that is used in weightlifting, right? It has a narrow center here. So for monocot plants, the gut cells are dumbbell shaped. Now, secondly, the distribution of stomata. For eudicot plants, the stomata is found in greater numbers on the lower epidermis. Upper epidermis may have some stomata, but fewer, much fewer than the, much less than the lower epidermis. Now for monocot plants, they usually have equal numbers of stomata on the upper and lower epidermis. There may be exceptions, okay, as stated in the textbook about the lily plant, which we'll discuss in the experiment later on, okay? Experiment on uh, determining the distribution of the stomata in the upper and lower epidermis of leaves. But usually, usually monocots have uh, equal numbers of stomata, almost equal number of numbers of stomata on the upper and lower epidermis because they are held more or less vertically, uh, whereas 
cord plants, the leaves are held horizontally. Now, adaptation to reduce water loss. That means, well, how does the stomata help to reduce water loss? The greater number of stomata on the lower epidermis, as stated up here, compared to the upper epidermis, helps to reduce water loss by transpiration. Okay? Because the lower epidermis is in a more, is in a shaded place. Uh, it's not directly exposed to sunlight as the upper epidermis. Now, for monocot plants, since they have equal numbers of stomata on upper and lower epidermis, they have other ways to reduce the loss of water. The leaves of monocot can be rolled up, you know, when it is uh, getting dehydrated, the leaves will be rolled up to reduce the surface area exposed to sunlight. Okay, so the stomata will be hidden in the rolled up leaves and there will be less evaporation of water. So this helps to reduce transpiration. Lastly, let's look at some questions from formative exercise 2.2. What is the difference between gaseous exchange in plants during respiration and photosynthesis? Two marks. Now, for all these questions, you can pause the video for a while and then try to answer it yourself. And after that, we can discuss the questions together. All right? Okay, let's look at the answer. So the first one is the difference between gaseous exchange in plants during respiration and photosynthesis. So we must know the equation for respiration and photosynthesis. All right? Now, the answer is that in respiration, oxygen is absorbed and carbon dioxide is released from cells through stomata. So the equation for respiration, the short form is go wet. Glucose plus oxygen produces water, energy and carbon dioxide. So oxygen is absorbed and used in respiration and carbon dioxide is released from the plant cells through the stomata. Okay, That is in respiration. Now, photosynthesis is the reverse of respiration. So carbon dioxide is absorbed in photosynthesis and oxygen is released from the cells according to equation wet go. Okay, so these two are the opposite of each other. These two processes are the opposite of each other. Number two, how does increased humidity in the surroundings affect the size of the stomatal opening? So increased humidity. So humidity is the is related to the water content in the in the atmosphere. The more water content there is, the higher the humidity of the place. Okay? Like on a rainy day. So how does increased humidity, like on a rainy day, in the surroundings, affect the size of the stomatal opening? Now, when humidity in the surroundings increases, water vapor content in the atmosphere increases. So the excess water vapor in the air will reduce the evaporation of water from the leaf cells. It will reduce the loss of water by transpiration or evaporation from the leaf cells. That means the plant is uh, hydrated, has a lot of water in, in its cells. So this will cause the gut cells to be more turgid and the size of the stoma will be larger. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if it is a dry condition with low humidity, then the gut cells will be flaccid and they will close the stomata. Number three, the stomatal distribution on the lower surface, leaf surface is more packed than the upper leaf surface. Explain. So this is a, sim a very uh, common question. Huh? Now explain why or you can, they can use the word justify. Huh? That means to explain why. So two marks. Huh? So the stomatal distribution is more packed on the lower leaf surface because the lower leaf surface is not exposed directly to the sunlight compared to the upper surface. Okay, so this means that uh, by having more stomata on the lower surface, uh, it will reduce the, or prevent the excessive loss of water through transpiration from the stomata of leaves, right? Because uh, the upper surface will be hotter and then it can cause more water loss through evaporation as it is more directly exposed to the sunlight, okay? So with more stomata on the lower surface, there is less loss of water through transpiration or evaporation from the stomata. Now lastly, what is the importance of stomatal closure stomatal closure when a plant lacks water. So the importance is that when the plant lacks water, the gut cells become flaccid, the stoma will close. This helps to prevent excessive loss of water from the plants by transpiration through the stomata and it will help to prevent dehydration of the plant. Right, that's all for this lesson.
Thanks for viewing and please do share, like and subscribe. See you again in the next video.